Hi, so uh, let us continue the green chemistry chapter here. Uh, today what I am going to cover is basically the history of green chemistry and then uh, what are the principles. So I am going to cover the first principle of green chemistry which is prevention of waste and I am going to cover three case studies in it uh, which is of Sita Glipton, Love Canal and Cuyahoga River and at the end I will conclude with E factor. So in this video you are going to get this much. Uh, so hello I am Dr. Neha and let us start with the first slide which is going to tell you what is the history of the term basically green chemistry. So now uh, in 1962 if you see uh, it is started with one uh, article which is silent spring and it was basically emphasized on the environmental pollution and environment. Uh, based on that till 1969 uh, US actually developed a council which is environmental quality council. In 1970 environmental protection agency EPA was born and till uh, today also we follow the policies of EPA. In 1980s to 88, uh, there was a shift <clears throat> and there was main uh, becoming like offices of pollution prevention and toxic was uh, made. In 1990, uh, W. Bush actually passed the Pollution Prevention Act and this was the year when the first uh, time the term green chemistry was coined at EPA by Paul Anistis in 1991. So basically it started with 1962, there was a landmark in 1970 when EPA was born and then in 1991 the term was coined. Followed by <coughs> EPA implements the green chemistry program in 1993 with uh, along with the uh, green chemical challenge award. Uh, right now also they give awards in 1995 and 6 it was uh, initiated. To 1997 they started one institute also and 1998 was the year when 12 principles of green chemistry were published by Paul Anastas and John Warner. So in uh, 1998 in fact it was coined so it's, it, it's lately you know it's not that old term. There were uh, certain incidences which actually made us think that there should be this kind of term. Like if you all uh, remember, the uh, huge recurse was there when in 1956 to 62, approximately 10,000 children were born with malformations because their mother have taken a pill which is uh, uh, morning sickness, uh, anti-morning sickness pill and that uh, because of that uh, the children were born with some defects. And you all, I guess you remember Cuyahoga River, which is also known as River with Fire. That also caught fire in 1969, was a major one. And in fact, till uh, today, 13 times it has caught fire. Later in my uh, this video, I'll discuss the detail of this. And uh, so is with this. In 1978, uh, New York Love Canal was actually you know uh, uh, became a dump site for hazardous waste hooker company purchased that and it dumped around 21,000 tons of waste i'll discuss this also in my video today only and then uh, who can forget this uh, disastrous incident at bhopal india itself in 1984 where methyl isocyanate was released or leaked <coughs> So this was the driving force that uh, government made a mandate to the industry people that lot many accidents are taking place and you take care. So that there were certain drivers like economic benefit was given to them. Government made legislations, uh, they made fines for the waste and uh, they imparted rules for uh, sending less hazardous material uh, in the dump site. And then there was societal pressure also like in a company if you are using a green concept uh, less polluting environment is there you have a public image you improve your public image there itself. So there were certain drivers behind uh, industry people to take this term into consideration. So basically green chemistry is a sustainable chemistry it's basically a philosophy wherein you encourage the design of product and processes uh, that minimize the use and generation of hazardous substances. Substance. Ultimately, you have to reduce the use of hazardous substance. Obviously, first time it was coined in 1991, Paul Anastas. Official definition also is uh, more or less similar that it's an approach to design. You may design also, you may manufacture and then you may use those products to deliberately reduce the hazard and protect the environment. Now coming uh, to what is basically green chemistry it's not only related with environment but anyhow if you're making a product and you're reducing waste then you're making the concept green 
either you are reducing the overall requirement of the material like earlier 10 kgs was required but now you can make it using 8 kgs so you are making the concept green hazards and risks and uh, energy like overall energy consumption is requ uh, is uh, less now overall cost consumption is less overall it is cost effective now so if you are working on any of the factors uh, you make the concept green ultimately so coming to what are the benefits of it uh, but there are not many you may count them like it is economical energy efficient less weights are produ produced safer products are made healthier workplaces are there definitely you got a competitive advantage over your uh, competitors and it prevents the pollution at molecular level basically uh, to sum up it is obviously uh, not related to chemistry only it is an interdisciplinary task and it reduces the negative impact on the environment and uh, sometimes eliminates hazards also etc etc so coming to what you have to consider in green chemistry is like cradle to grave approach so right from the inception when you think uh, you are making any concept or you are making any product right from the inception in the cradle you have to think is it green or not and you have to uh, think till grave means end of life management like you start with raw materials so you just find out whether is there any risk or not are, are you following green uh, chemistry principle then during the synthesis also when you're making the particular product then the end products uh, like when the product is completed and it goes to the customer and then end of life management until the uh, consumer is using the product you have to think on like if you remember there were some uh, mobile company wherein uh, the battery was exploding so the company had to take the entire batch back from the customers so that is violation of green chemistry principle they did not thought that while using uh, the product at that time also your product has to be green and also at the time of disposing once the product is over the life is over till then the product should be green so uh, basically synthetic chemistry is the starting from where you have to go to the uh, green chemistry concept you have to force synthetic chemists those who are working in the lab they are making daily new things uh, developing improved ways on making the chemicals and the product you have to compel them to make it environment friendly as much as possible and how uh, you can do that so you have two approaches the first one is you use existing feedstock feedstock means uh, the raw material which you have so you use uh, ready-made like whatever material is there use it no problem but then make them more environmentally benign or greener right or you substitute other feedstock which is already environmentally friendly right so sometimes what happens is your product is there but uh, let's say uh, it is like ethanol is the product which you want c2h5oh now uh, you're making like the overall uh, you cannot change uh, the uh, like you don't uh, you have to use existing feedstock but you have to make it more environmentally benign or you substitute other feedstock that are made by environmentally friendly means what does that mean that means what is uh, the conventional process to make ethanol you are not doing it in fact uh, you are using uh, starch for fermentation c6h12o6 and add that on fermentation will give you ethanol so what are you doing you are substituting other feedstock so you are not using the original raw material in fact you are using a raw material which is already environmentally benign so this is the thing where you are substituting the original raw material by environmentally benign process while the first thing is that um, you use the existing feedstock that uh, like you cannot change a particular uh, raw material but you can make it environment benign so that is the second approach so either you use the conventional approach which the people are already using but change it somehow uh, or you change the entire feedstock and make it environment friendly so there are only two options to go with the product either you change some existing material or you change the material itself 
then there are 12 principles of green chemistry in the coming videos i would be discussing them one by one so i'm just skipping the slide today my target is just to complete the first uh, principle of green chemistry and it says prevention of waste or by product so what is that is uh, we normally prepare a, a product but we forget what happens at the end it, it is it going to end up in a waste and e waste i guess you understand is the biggest problem right now because when we produced we did not think of that it is going to end up in a waste and now we have to think what to do with that so this is obviously a violation of the first principle the first principle says that it is better to prevent waste than to treat it or clean up simple if you have like potato and you have to make some dish out of it right so your aim or product is dish now one person make a fries potato fries other person make wedges right so which one is a greener concept definitely wedges because in potato wedges you use peel also while uh, it is when it is fry the peel end up in a waste so you have not thought of first principle you have ended up in a waste and now you have to treat it or clean it so extra energy gets wasted uh, when you have waste so what do you think uh, you can do is first option is either you make a process like uh, less waste is generating like first one is where more waste is generated product and waste is there right and the second process is saying that you do something within the process so that it is utilized the recycling is done and less wastes are generated so you have to prevent the waste basically so in this case you just have to follow the second one reduce the waste if you reduce the waste uh, reduction is better otherwise you have to recycle it or reuse it you have to take extra measures and i guess you understand if you take one step then there will be generation uh, requirement of cost requirement of energy etc so that will be wasted so now let us go with, uh, with the case studies three case studies first is cetagliptin uh, cetagliptin is basically type 2 anti uh, uh, diabetic uh, uh, material active ingredient in genuvia basically and uh, what is done here is by the company Merck they have actually uh, received the presidential green chemistry award uh, for this uh, generation what they have done is what was the conventional method to prepare cetagliptin that included total of eight steps and there were several high molecular weight reagents that were ending up in a waste now you imagine 220 pounds were getting wasted per pound of your cetagliptin at that time right 220 pounds less waste uh, uh, it has generated and uh, if you can you know imagine in terms of a lifetime over the lifetime Merck when they developed they developed it one pot synthesis and they thought that they will at least uh, eliminate 330 million pounds of waste if they prepare by this synthesis in fact it was eight step it was nearly uh, three steps and that involved one pot synthesis also one of them uh, you can see the overall yield is increased by around 40 50 percent and then they have uh, wastage obviously was reduced to half and that is why in development of this Kirel uh, beta amino acid derivative Merck got this award for this revolutionary change so this is a classic example of uh, green principle number one what was that principle prevention of waste so the Merck company did something on this uh, principle and they reduced the wastage to nearly half so this is the example where the green chemistry principle is followed let us go to another one where it is not followed i hope you remember love canal uh, tragedy the environmental disaster it was basically a model plant community uh, in 1920 uh, the canal became a dump site for municipal refuse now during 1940 the hooker chemical company actually take permission to dump their things and then in around 1942 and all they actually uh, got the permission and they started dumping uh, their uh, thing there they in fact bought the canal also and it was actually subsequently uh, around 16 acre of the area where this dumping was done so uh, in 1948 around 
the hooker company became the sole user and owner of the site they started uh, continued dumping it till 1952 and in 1952 around it was decided that now it is to be used for construction because now uh, like uh, near niagara uh, region niagara fall uh, there was increase in the population and this uh, particular site is to be utilized so you imagine till these uh, many years hooker company was utilizing it for a dump site and they have almost dumped around 22000 tons of the chemicals and mostly the chemicals were caustic alkali fatty acids chlorinated hydrocarbons now you imagine that particular uh, place was given to a a uh, school to build a school uh, despite the disclaimer given to that uh, school the school board began the construction they made the 99th street the school there and they started it so in 1954 uh, when the excavation was uh, being done uh, the workers found uh, there uh, like there were drums containing chemical waste but then they continued doing that and in around 1955 the school was started very soon uh, like uh, they discovered that like 25 foot area there is crumbled and it is exposing toxic chemical and which is then filled with water during rainstorm so i guess you understand the children enjoyed the large puddle uh, playing in that uh, large puddle and they started falling sick so the school district uh, sold that remaining land to the home uh, construction private developers they developed around 800 uh, houses there around uh, private houses 250 low income apartments then the people started living there now you imagine till then also like in the canal what they have uh, da- done was they actually buried it at around 20 to 25 feet deep right and then they put a layer of uh, layer of deep clay on it in order to prevent the leakage there was a clay sea but even after so many years uh, in 1976 there were two reporters who went there they tested that because the people were complaining of uh, the black fluid coming out of it they were complaining about odor etc and then it was found that around 200 chemicals toxic organic chemicals are disposed here 10 of the most toxic compound like benzene also which is a carcinogenic compound were identified uh, there and then all of the family like 800 families and all they were relocated uh, to the other side and then the government utilized their super fund and the super fund ended up in 2004 where uh, they a complete cleaning operation demolished so now you imagine uh, just because they have not followed the principle number 1 they ended up in so much of the waste and now since they have so much of the waste they need to have a dump site and they used love canal for that dumping thing and it took so many years till 2004 to get the particular thing evacuated and cleaned up so so much of the energy and time and money everything is wasted coming to the second one kaikoga river uh, cleveland ohio i hope you uh, remember about this also this was uh, the river in us uh, located in northeast ohio now here what happened is uh, like it is basically a dumping site for many of uh, the industries and it was one of the most polluted river in us basically the entire uh, reach from akron to cleveland you can say was devoid of fish because of uh, that only and there was lot much of the industrial pollution and that much that it caught fire at least 13 times till date and the like most famous was in 1969 uh, the fire was there it is actually near to railroad bridge and uh, due to that uh, railroad bridge sometimes due to spark and all it actually caught fire why because uh, there was the entire surface if you see is covered with brown oily substance black heavy oil uh, come on the top and it is several inches thick layer now you imagine uh, this is so much of the thick that uh, if you can you know if the layer is thick then there is no uh, contact uh, with the uh, oxygen and anaerobic action is common in that and as 
the dissolved oxygen is seldom obviously above a fraction of parts per million very very less dissolved oxygen was there and that is why there was no aquatic animals present and obviously uh, the discharge of cooling water here increases the temperature by 10 to 15 degree fahrenheit then the velocity becomes negligible and the sludge accumulates at the bottom also and that is how the animal life does not exist and the entire layer becomes grey brown to rusty brown etc etc so many a times it has caught fire people have taken uh, this into consideration there were articles in time magazine uh, taking a you know uh, they said that it is a river that oozes rather than flows imagine and in which a person does not drown but decays and this kind of thing came into picture and then uh, it is started uh, they started walking on it now you imagine river on fire rainbow of many different colors different different name was given to it and this also is a classic example of violation of first principle which is prevention of waste if you don't end up in a waste you don't have to dump it or treat it or recycle it no need is required so i hope uh, till here you are able to understand what i'm trying to say first principle says prevention of waste now coming to the last uh, point of my video today i'll tell you what is e factor the e factor is very important in order to understand how much waste you are going to generate what is the e factor is greenness of the chemical process given by roger shelton what is e factor mass of total waste by mass of product let's say uh, you make a product a changes to p and it gives some waste also now let's say your total waste is 2 kg and your total product is 10 kg so what is your e factor what is the e factor of your uh, uh, product is basically 2 by 10 so you may say 0.2 is the e factor so from this you'll be able to understand how much waste is generated now if you see here in oil refining the production is this much and waste is this much if you'll divide you'll get the e factor around 0 to 0.1 while in bulk chemicals if you're making bulk chemicals in large amount then the production uh, and waste like lies in the ratio of 1 uh, to 5 so that is up to like the mark it's okay but if you are making fine chemicals like very very specific chemicals then what happens is the number of steps increases and due to which the uh, the e factor also increases while if you are in pharmaceuticals then it's okay up to 25 to 100 your e factor may rise so crucially basically this metric is very important for industry people because if they are making some product and uh, they are having waste they need to know what is the e factor and with that i hope you understand that higher the amount of waste like here higher would be the amount of e factor right so higher e factor means more waste so definitely if your uh, concept is is green then the e factor should be less that is what is favorable coming to how are you going to apply this factor is first one is important that to get specific results about air water or any waste like if i'm working in an air company and i want to like uh, in a company wherein air emissions are there so i want to know how much air is emitted as a waste so what i can do is i can just include only one kilogram of air emission in the e factor equation and uh, when we do this we uh, get to know about specifically any kind of waste so that is very important to calculate second is to evaluate any changes in the processes like if you are like you uh, like the just the way i told you that in green chemistry you have two options available right uh, either you uh, use the same method which they are using or do something uh, change in it or you change the entire uh, product only right so right now let's say you want to do any change in the process fine people were earlier using a plus b to form c where d was a waste what you're trying to do is using a and c and then there is a waste but then it would be less as you uh, think there will be a change so what how can you evaluate you can uh, do the calculations of e factor for step one for a uh, some set duration and then for step two for the set uh, duration so for the same duration if you follow the process here find out the e factor and you change your parameter again find out the e factor if your e factor becomes better right 
when there is less generation of waste that means e factor becomes better that will surely evaluate that what change you have done is it good or bad for the process right sahi baat hai na agar waste kam banega to mera e factor kya tha waste by product hi tha theek hai waste kam banega to obviously less ho jayega less ho jayega to obviously better ho jayega main ye bol sakti hu ki mera jo process hai wo green hai aur jo change maine kiya wo permissible hai coming to the third one is to amplify your role in the supply chain that means like you, if you are in a marketing thing this is very important and tricky thing let me tell you how let's say you are making a product uh, and that is utilized by your client to make their product right this is your client so you are supplying your uh, product to a client which is further using it to make some product now when they make this uh, b so they waste 5 kg of your uh, a in making 10 kg of b so what is the e factor for them e factor would be uh, 0.5 i hope you remember 5 by 10 0.5 fine so they are uh, having a e factor of 0.5 but then b include that a which you have made and you also should have some e factor of yours राइट right? लेट से आपने जब ये ए बनाया तो आपका ई e फैक्टर था टू के पर टेन के जी दैट इज पॉइंट टू तो अब अगर हम बोले कि बी के लिए ई e फैक्टर क्या है तो आई गेस यू अंडरस्टैंड दैट द टोटल ई फैक्टर वुड बी पॉइंट सेवन टू मेक बी फ्रॉम ए राइट दैट इज द प्रोसेस नाउ हाउ की कैन यूज इट इन सप्लाई चेन यू कैन शो इट टू देम दैट योर कॉम्पिटिटर इज ऑल्सो मेकिंग ए and they can also supply to you but their e factor is 0.6 let's say 6 kg per 10 kg so now if your client uses your competitors a so their e factor total will become 1.1 while when the client was using your compound the e factor is 0.7 now can you have a look on both and can you decide which uh, concept is green which is better definitely this is better e factor should be less and that's how you can highlight that your compound is better than your competitor and they should go ahead with it so that's that will amplify your role coming to the fourth one to be used in sustainability reporting so uh, the every industry nowadays they publish their sustainability rep uh, report uh, and they give it uh, to the public for accessing it so public uh, will appreciate if you use e factor in their reporting that will create a very good impression also when you say that you have a product where the e factor is only 1 while the other competitor is giving you e factor 10 so that uh, creates a good impression so you should you can include it in sustainability reporting and at the same time you can share that with all of your stakeholders shareholders uh, executives etc so because it is a very you know numeric value so you'll be able to understand like one value or five or 10 it is a numeric value very easy to understand very clear and concise form of measurement so you can utilize this uh, simple number to show that you make more user friendly and memorable compounds so i think with this you are able to understand uh, what we have done is the first law prevention of waste there were three case studies discussed and at end i have discussed e factor in coming uh, videos i uh, would take practice problem and numericals of e factor atom economy and percentage yield uh, till then if you are new to my channel please do subscribe and uh, like uh, the video thank you so much